Welcome to the TMRN Time Monk Radio Network. I'm Jules, and today is Saturday, the 30th of July, 2011. Today we have Kostas Denos, an author, researcher, martial artist, Nikung practitioner, and one of only five known Western students accepted by John Chang. Kostas has written two books, including The Magus of Java, Teachings of an Authentic Taoist Immortal, The Story of John Chang. John Chang was one of the first to be documented performing pyrokinesis, telekinesis, levitation, telepathy, and other paranormal abilities. Hello, Costas. Yasas, Hello. and welcome to the WebBot Forum Roundtable. Nice to be here. This is good for us, too. The WebBot Forum administrator is Fox, and today he will be doing the recording and technical support of the show. Several members of the forum were kind enough to join us tonight. They include members Free Spirit, Green Meadow, Disaster Cat, Uranus Rising, and Plain. For listeners, this interview will assume you have a fairly good understanding of Mr. Denaus's work, including his book, The Magus of Java. Mr. Denaus's work is available at innertraditions.com, along with all good bookstores. His blog is blog.pamachon.gr. Pamachon is spelled P-A-M-M-A-C-H-O-N. This interview will be available on YouTube for free on the WebBot Forum channel and at the website webbotforum.com. Are you all ready to go, sir? I'm fine. Fantastic. The first question for today is, Costas, in your book, you mentioned that level four was a significant level in Nikung when the practitioner could use his Yan energy in his Dantian and interact with Yin energy. He could then live after death, his memories carried over to the afterlife. You also mentioned that at level four, the next levels meant you achieved twice the power of the previous level. So level 5, you had twice the power of level 4. Level 10, you had twice the power of level 9. Calculating level 72, that is 2 to the power of 69, or approximately 590 million trillion times stronger than level 3. A person at that level would almost be considered a god. Perhaps someone at that level could manifest reality and create things from thin air, like an orange or an apple, as described in the Sutras of Patanjali. What would someone at that level be able to do, sir? And did your Sifu ever tell you stories of Chan Sang Feng? And could you share them with us tonight? No, I, I've never heard stories like that. Uh, I'm assuming that somebody who is at level 72 would be considered a Buddha, so that would be equivalent to uh, the sutra that you mentioned. Okay, and um, did your Sifu ever talk to you about anybody around that level, such as Chan Sang Feng? No, not at all. He, you have to understand, uh, Pak Jan was a very local Chinese tradition, and by that I mean that he had no interest in exploring things beyond what was passed on to him by his own master. So, uh, you know, we, we view a lot of these things uh, in the West, especially today, uh, scholastically. But for these people, they, they're real living traditions that are passed on as culture, as teachings, as a way of life, as uh, part of their family, part of uh, what they do every day. They're, they're not on a pedestal. They're not removed from them. They are not the uh, Western scholars, let's say, dissatisfied with their own culture that are going out there trying to find something more. We're guilty of that. We are the ones who tend to look at things in, in a greater context than what the people who are practicing themselves do. So, uh, in summary, no, John never talked to me about Chan San Feng. He had no knowledge whatsoever of, of that, other than the stories that I put in the book. Okay, thank you, sir. Costas, um, in your book also, you retold the story of two level 51 masters in the Battle of the Immortals when Lim fought Pai Lok Nen. John said chi power could be used for good or for evil, and mastery could be achieved by a good man or a bad man. Uh -huh. Do you believe, sir, that there is an elite, maybe like above the Bilderberg group and the presidents that steer world agendas? Certainly the elites seem to use astrology and numerology, but is it possible that a few of them may be um, similar to John Chang and have similar powers? And why would they have an interest in civilization? Let me counter that question with... Uh, um, here's you know, my, I mean, my assumption. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, my assumption, sir, for that question was that um, it, um, for for um, for 
for them to be able to be in such control of um, society at the moment, I, I would I would have assumed that maybe they would use something similar, some technique or power similar to what John Chang might have to be able to take an advantage of society. Yeah, but why would they want to take an advantage of society? You're assuming that somebody that uh, escalates to a given level still has an interest in, in uh, everyday affairs. Um, that's not always the case. I would say the more removed they are, uh, the more independent they are of our own personal desires and, and, and whims. I mean, I'll tell you a story that really has nothing to do with, with somebody that's level 52 or, or 72 or anything like that. Uh, it has to do with a man that I met who was a uh, Korean master of martial arts. Uh, he had he masqueraded as a Taekwondo teacher, but uh, basically he had his brother-in-law was Chinese, and he had developed very peculiar abilities. He used to demonstrate here in Greece by standing on fluorescent bulbs and snapping uh, two-by-fours in half, and that after inviting anyone from the crowd to try to break the two-by-four or stand on the fluorescent bulbs. Uh, this man, when we were discussing, when I had first started training with uh, Pak Jan, he said to me, you know, there are people out there in hiding that uh, the abilities of which you cannot imagine. And at that time, I was too inexperienced to really understand what he meant, but I understand it now. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, if somebody like that is in society, the thing that he desires the most is to live like a simple human being. And if they're not, then they're not. I mean, they just have no interest in it. Okay, yeah, I see what you mean, sir. You're, you're asking me for my opinion, sir. I could be right, I could be wrong. I mean... Uh... Uh, no, I, I, think, I, I think what you're getting at is people um, of a certain level, they no longer need to, say, prove themselves or control things. They're above that, sort of. Correct, or they no longer care. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, a personal duel between the two of them. Uh, imagine what it would take, the, the hatred that... Uh, would be required for someone to dedicate his life just to be able to to deal with somebody else. Um, so in that case, it's a very personal thing directed towards one person, not towards society in general. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Disaster Cat. Hi. Uh, my husband has studied Eastern martial arts, and he's written books on Germanic rune staves and also practices recreated medieval combat. I noticed that you were involved in recreating a style of, I think, ancient Greek combat forms. If this is the case, do you feel there are things in common for all these disciplines, especially when it comes to the inner movings of energy that accompany the actual stylized combat? I say stylized because the idea is not to actually kill the opponent during the fight, even if the knowledge to actually kill someone may be taught as part of the training. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm not involved in recreating ancient Greek martial arts or, or medieval martial arts. I'm uh, involved in recreating martial art that was taught in my own village until uh, the Second World War that my grandfather studied. Uh, I, he attempted to show this to me uh, circa 1983 when he was still alive, but at that time I was too young and powerful and immortal and, and knew better, of course, having done judo and karate, so... I really wasn't interested in what he was trying to show me. And to be honest, at that time, I had no idea that uh, this martial art existed. I just found this out uh, circa 2002, 2003, by repairing a wall in my house and finding photos, which led me to further research, and I found further photos in libraries and this and that. And uh, much to my amazement, I found that a martial art, a well-documented martial art, was taught in Greece during the 19th century, and that's what I'm trying to recreate. So, no, I'm not trying to recreate ancient Greek martial arts. Uh, I think we've gone a long way past the phalanx and, uh, and the shield and, and the spear. Um, to answer the second part of your question, yes, I believe that there are universal principles underlying all of this. I believe that uh, until a very recent times, it was part of our culture. I mean, you have to understand... Uh, I was born in the U.S. I moved back to Greece when I was 12, and I went from a metropolitan uh, environment to a very small mountain village near the Albanian border where people still farmed and raised sheep and, and saw spirits at night and, and uh, had very different belief systems. So 
I view everything I've done is within this context, and I've been privileged to touch this past generation within my own life, uh, the way that they lived. And so, uh, you know, uh, I think that's something that we've lost in the West, and, and I think that's one reason that we're so desperate to investigate Eastern culture. I mean, I'm not Chinese. Uh, it would be very difficult for me to become Chinese. Um, but what I believe that we in the West is are seeking in Oriental culture is something that, that we have lost, that we need. And our, as our society has become more structured and mechanized, uh, this aspect of it has been lost, much like it's being lost in the East right now. I mean, uh, the Orient now is not what it was 20 years ago, and most certainly not what it was 30 years ago. So uh, I don't know if I'm rambling on or if I've answered your question, Disaster Cat, but... Uh, Pretty much. Um, the, the reason that, that I was asking about these similarities was because one of the most amazing you know, combats I ever saw in our medieval group was between two fighters who had martial arts training, and you could really feel the energy swirling around between them. It was like the air itself was almost on fire. And mm-hmm. even though I don't fight myself, I did find this really interesting and wondered if on some basic level you felt that training and moving of energy or the chi or whatever it's called in a particular tradition was as important is training the body and how to move when engaging in this kind of, of, of a combat or sport? I don't think that there are separate things. Um, I, I definitely believe uh, that there is something that exists that we as Western physics don't have a name for as of yet, although if you look at, at our physical model, uh, we understand that there's something missing. Um, but I don't think that it's something separate that you can train separately. In other words, you train your body, you train this energy, you train your emotions, you train your mind. The the way that I teach somebody is I'll I'll take them through a process where the first thing I'll do is I'll train their body, and then the next thing I'll do is I'll teach them how to control their emotions as much as possible or to become one with their emotions. That would be a better word. And the third thing would be to train your mind so that you don't get upset in the middle of a, of a confrontation. And then I'll teach them how to enhance their energetic process. Because uh, what happens is if you go any other way, you can make yourself more emotional or more upset or less in control of your mind or all these things. So energy is just one aspect of, of anything to do with combat or life or, or anything like that. Yes, my husband has mentioned the anger control problem as being one of the, the hardest things to teach young fighters. I really appreciate your, your answer, and I want to thank you because it was, it was really interesting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Costa, this is uh, Free Spirit, and we were wondering what level of Nate Kung you've advanced to and what special skills you've now acquired. And we also were curious to know if working through the levels of Nate Kung have affected you as a person and what are some of the things that you've been able to note that have changed about yourself mentally physically or spiritually and which change do you feel is the most profound and meaningful well i make a better pizza now than i used to i don't know if <laughs> that has uh, anything to do i i don't think that nay kung is something that uh, is geared towards society as a whole. And, and, and there I'm recanting uh, previous statements that I've made in my books. I think it's, it's always been a monastic tradition. It's something that, because what it is, Nikong is basically enhancing power. So there again, if you have to work for a living or if you're involved in society on a daily basis uh, and you, you have uh, the ups and downs of life, then it's very difficult to, to practice uh, this sort of thing. It's better to just go away and and be alone. And that's something to be quite fair that that Pak John uh, told me from the very beginning that I didn't grasp and I thought that it was something that could be used uh, in general in society as a whole, which is why I wrote the book. Um, I believe that that, uh, Nekum is like taking steroids. I mean, it can go either way. It can go very bad. It can go very good for a small amount of time. Uh, you have to be very, very careful with it. You have to 
be careful not to abuse it, and you have to be careful how you use it. I mean, it's very similar to the uh, Tumul practice that's done in Tibetan yoga, where if you look at the statistics of the people that actually start out and how many have negative effects and how many uh, actually qualify to, to be able to do the yogas, uh, only a very small percentage does. So in that context, uh, I will not answer your question regarding my own self, uh, because I believe that it's a very personal thing for everyone. But I hope that I've answered your question as regards to Nacon. Thank as you, a sir. Thank you, Free uh, Spirit. Um, next question is from Plain. Costas, do you know of any martial arts coming from ancient India or the Vedic texts? It seems like uh, mental weapons may have been part of their arsenal, at least if one reads some of the Vedas. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I, I've also read that. Uh, in fact, the, the Brahmins uh, supposedly defeated the Chatriyas by uh, engaging higher energies of the mind, and, and that might be a battle between uh, Nekum and uh, some other practice that has more to do with mind than, than with uh, the more gross energies of the body. Um, there are martial arts that are Indian in origin that historically have been documented. Uh, we know the Buddha practiced martial arts. We know we have reference to a martial art called Vajramushti, circa the, the 12th century AD. And then uh, the last 200 years or so, we have reference of somebody of an art called uh, Kalari Payat. Uh, and I'm sure that, that you've heard this before. Um, if one could say that there is a historic martial art that's been associated with, with Buddhism that we can prove a reference in that context, then uh, I will have to say I don't know. But I've also read the Vedas and been fascinated by that description of, uh, of the warriors getting their ass kicked by the, by the priests. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Green Meadow, you got a question for Costas. Thank you. It's wonderful listening to your voice. You have a wonderful resonance. Oh, um, really? Yes, actually. My question is actually somewhat about the Schumann resonance. There's been some speculation that the Schumann resonance, which is a subsonic energy wave that exists between the Earth and the top of the atmosphere, is actually a combination of yin energy from the Earth and yang energy from the sun. When you work with yin and yang energy in your body, is it solely in your body, or do you draw from the outside energy as well? No, no, we draw energy from the outside. It's not from within our body. Okay. It's something that exists in the world. Uh, and there is a clear distinction between the two. In fact, uh, when you're doing meditation correctly, uh, what you'll see is a, and you're sitting on, let's say, a, a clay floor, something that's porous, you'll see a wet spot underneath your body where it appears that, that something has been drawn in and that moisture is actually condensing. And it's cold. It's not, it's not warm. Uh, for me, I've seen it soak into clay tile and look like a spot and, and stay there for you know half an hour before it evaporates. So uh, it's definitely something coming from the ground and something coming from the air. Wow. There have been some experiments where they actually cut people off from either the yin or the yang portion of the Schumann resonance, mm -hmm. and this caused uh, illness or physical weakness. When the first astronauts left the planet and its yin energy, they were unable to walk when they returned, and now they have machines in the shuttles to duplicate the yin portion of the Schumann resonance, and that fixed the problem. Do you think that people can cut themselves off from their own yin or yang centers? And if they do, what symptoms do you see? I think there are practices of assassination that use just that. Uh, at least that's what I've been told, that, that there are psychic attacks that, whose intention is to cut off uh, the supply of one energy or the other to, uh, to people. Uh, so... In the context of uh, esotericism, uh, they're definitely there. In the context of Western physics, um, I would say that there's a whole lot we don't know. I mean, uh, as I indicated in, in, uh, in my books, we're becoming 
more and more accepting of Eastern notions uh, as each decade goes by. At the same time, we are also understanding esoteric concepts more as our science progresses. For example, uh, when I was studying Nacon at that time, we didn't know there was an enderic nervous system, which would have explained so many things that we were feeling, uh, because basically what you're doing is you're programming a separate self, and lo and behold, all of a sudden you have a, a nervous structure that can accept this, that, that it's actually more powerful than our spine, and, and this was unknown at the time. At the same time, if you look at the uh, what's become accepted now in astrophysics that was not accepted 20 years ago, it's simply astounding. I mean, we've, we've seen that the speed of gravity, it's been proven rather that the speed of gravity is equal to the speed of light. Uh, we've pretty much accepted that uh, the expansive force uh, of solar energy is what's keeping the universe from collapsing, but we don't know what it is. We've understood, <laughs> we've understood more and more that cells have memory. Uh, if you read Roger Penrose's stuff and you start looking at macrotubules within the, the cell, you know, it just becomes uh, amazing. So my ambition is, if, or, or my hope rather than my ambition is, if we survive the next 20 years, and that's a big if as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm one of the people who believe that societal collapse might be just right around the corner if we're not careful, and, and I hope it doesn't happen. But if we survive the next 20 years, then we will truly enter an age that will be wonderful. And, and I hope I'm there to see it, basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm personally along the line of, can we have breakdown so we can have breakthrough? Um, but I have a follow-up question about the yin and yang. Sure. In men and women, are the yin and yang centers different? Or are they the same? I don't know. Along the straight line, uh, along the center line of the body, they're the same. Uh, I was told that they're reversed in men and women, but I'm not a woman, so I can't answer that question in, in, uh, in fairness. I can only tell you what uh, where I've been told. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Costa, um, are you familiar with Jet Li, Jackie Chan, and Donnie Yen and their form of martial arts? Um, the reason I ask is I've seen Jackie Chan hold an egg in his palm and then break six concrete slabs with the same hand and not break the egg. Is he using yang energy only, do you think? Um, or do you think um, any of them um, might be familiar or with, um, say, yin energy and its uses as well? Well, I don't think... I, I think, again, that uh, the separation and the distinction that, that we make between the two is incorrect. And, and I also uh, believe that Quantifying it and classifying practices like this is, is incorrect. It's remarkable that Jackie Chan can do that. Uh, I've, I've seen it done by other people as well. Um, but you, you have to understand, our desire for, for classification and, and uh, if you will, layering of these principles, is it's a very latent European phenomenon that, that really took place after the 15th, 16th century. I mean, look at music. Notes didn't used to exist. I mean, uh, people would would uh, play based on free resonance. And then, uh, who was it? Was it Bach, I think, that, that actually came up with a formalized system and, and created the scale, do, re, mi, etc. Uh, before that, and, and the reason he did that was so that it would be easier for orchestras to, to play together because as new and new... Uh, methods of playing music and, and instruments were created, then it became more complex for these large orchestras that they were using um, to be able to, uh, to coordinate themselves. But still in the East, for example, if you, if you listen to Indian music or, or Arabian music or even classical Greek music, there are no notes. I mean, there are what we call as uh, roads. Uh, in Arabic, it's makam. It just means uh, a path or, or... Anyway, uh, this classification and segregation and, and trying to, not mathematically, because math is actually a very liberal and free language, but uh, to model these processes might be incorrect. So my opinion is that, yes, Jackie is probably using yin chi, and I guess he doesn't even know it, and he doesn't care either. 
I've been privileged to be the student of uh, other men that I consider great masters of uh, Chinese martial arts, and the deliberation and the segregation of the concepts that, that I put in uh, Manga of Java, which was strictly based on uh, my learning that from Park Chan at the time and my understanding at the time, uh, might not be correct. I mean, I don't think that, that they view things so separately and segregated, let me put it that way. They're just using energy, and they're using their mind to control it. Could you tell us, maybe in a broad sense for non-practicing Nikong people, how do you use that energy, um, maybe broadly? Could you share it with us or tell us how it's to a layman person? In what context? In terms of, obviously, people that have read Magus of Java have seen how the use of energy can be used. For example, um, I believe you told a story of John Chang going to California and then after a challenge he accepted, he put two coins in his hands and then when he closed them and opened them, the coins had you know, been squashed together. So in terms of the use of that energy, how would somebody conceptualize how would that actually do that? And how would energy flow that would come flow through the palms, anything like that? I see. Uh, you mean uh, as far as the, the process by which it's done? Correct. Well, in the Magus of Java, I, I put in photos of burn marks that, that appeared in the center of the palm and, and along the pericardium meridian, uh, which, uh, what, which happened when I was uh, fully training. So you could actually see at that point uh, energy bubbling out of the center of the palm and, and running up to the, uh, the fingers. Uh, that is the process. Uh, how you use it, I guess it's up to you. You know, I mean, why you're training, it's, uh, it's a very personal thing. If you embrace the theological, uh, I mean, the, the Indonesian Chinese do it because they believe the theological concepts that are uh, propagated by the school. That if you do this, then your spirit will survive and you will retain your intellect, etc., etc., etc. If you don't believe in that, and you look at Nekong strictly as uh, an exercise, the question is, why should you train? Why do you train? What need will it serve? What do you want to, to achieve out of it? So, uh, in that context, you have to look at what, what you want to do with it. For me, as a martial artist at that time, I wanted to be able to knock people out when I hit them. So, uh, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, uh, I don't know if I've answered your question or if I'm rambling again. But. I guess it, it's pretty hard to to, um, to, I, I, to, to get an answer um, if, if, if you don't actually do Nikul. I mean, I guess it, it'd be hard to, to sir, put it in words. Path, what paths the energy physically follows? Is that what you're trying to answer, ask me? Yes, I believe you stated previously that the energy of the yang energy is stored in the dantian, and then from there you push it out somehow through certain oh, areas of your body. Hard. It goes up to your heart, and from your heart to your hands, or up to your head, depending on where you want to uh, to drive it. Are you thinking of anything visually, or how do you actually push it? I heard a term in a video with Jim McMillan where one of the teachers said to him when he was trying to move boxes using telekinesis that it was like going to the toilet, pushing down. Was, is something similar like that? Uh, it never was like that for me, no. I just wanted it to happen and it happened but you know I mean how do you move your hand uh, do you work at it do you does it happen naturally I'm sure that when you were six months it was much more difficult and then as you progress along the life it became far easier if you were to um, start a new activity now uh, for example do you play lacrosse I don't know if you do but if, if you play lacrosse then there's a an element involved where you'll be learning it which would make it far more difficult and it would have to be deliberate. You know, it's a step like this, move your body like this, swing your arms like this. And you would have to actually go through that process to do it and then you would learn it. And then you wouldn't have to do that. You would just do it. So uh, moving the energy light is pretty much like that. Uh, the, the interesting thing with the Tantian is when the Tantian becomes a, a separate entity and there is a point when you're training when it does become that. It becomes uh, a replication of yourself. And 
then it can also move when it wants. And that's where the danger to other people uh, comes in, because if it's frightened or angry, or you might suddenly find yourself picking up at, at, at full power and you had no intention of doing that. Almost a life of its own. Um, apparently, much, um, yes. but, but that's what, if, if I may, that's what I meant when... When uh, I mean, and, and you can you can see this in in, uh, in a lot of Taoist scripture where they're talking about you know the, the inner child and all that. And and for me, like I said, it was eye opening to find out that uh, there is a an enteric nervous system that's in fact more more complex than the than the spine itself. Because for me, that explained a lot of what I was experiencing when I was uh, training full board. And I guess that's why um, some people, um, including I think somebody that studied under you, Sean Denty, um, he did say that, um, or others have said that, once you get to a certain level, it can be dangerous if you don't train or practice Ni Kung a, a particular way because of, who, I guess, what you just you said. Say, who, sorry, who did you say studied under me? I've just read in some of the blogs that did somebody, um, did you have a person that trained with you by name of Sean? No. No? Okay. Well, I, I was reading a blog that he said he was, so maybe oh. he wasn't. More power to him. A lot of a lot, a lot of people say a lot of different things, but uh, I, I don't know anybody like that. Okay, thank you. The next question we have is from Green Meadow. Hello. Hi. I'm actually asking two questions from Cliff High, who is the creator of the web bots, and he's also an Aikidoist. Okay. He would like to know if, when Chi Key is building in meditation. Have you contacted the stream? If so, have you entered the stream? And can you tell if others are present in the stream simultaneously? You would have to lose yourself in the stream completely to do that. And that's uh, more a level of the mind. Mind and energy are two different things, though. And, and of course, they're, they're interconnected, interrelated. I mean, it's like saying uh, the nervous system and, and the circulatory system. But... The more you lose yourself, the more you'll be able to see other things. But on the other hand, the more you'll lose yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you to make that decision. Have you entered the stream? Do you know what he's talking about? Yes, I know what he's talking about, yes. Okay. I, I don't do that un unless uh, it's very important. Okay. Um, and then... When developing yin force and meditation, do you sense it or feel it in your hara, like in the solar plexus, as an expansion? No, it's not in the solar plexus, and uh, it's not anywhere in any of the uh, center energetic uh, cords of the body. It's, in fact, all around. It's not something that you, you put in. It, it sort of follows the, the yang chi wherever it goes. So... When you generate uh, yang chi, if you sit down, then automatically you'll pull in yin chi because it wants to be in equal amount wherever the, the uh, yang chi is. There are schools that, that train uh, in the development of yin chi itself. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know anything about that. So did your training include both or just the yang? My, my training included both, yes. Okay. But Thank one you. Rose, one rose as a consequence of the other. You don't you don't deliberately say that oh I'm going to pull in yin chi now. It just happens. Okay. I mean there are there are ways to do that, but I can't understand why anyone would want to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Costas, this is plain again. I've got a couple of questions from um, Cliff uh, as well. Um, so here goes. Uh, if the generative um, Chen Yang force naturally spins clockwise, does it mean that using an act of will that causes it to spin anti-clockwise initiates a period of accepting Kun Yin force? I don't know anything about spins or, or anything like that, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, there's a follow-up part of that that may not may not uh, be relevant. It says, if so, uh, is this as is held by the tradition of the yellow flower or golden elixir to be compressed? 
Sorry, I, I didn't understand that line again. Well, it's based on the first uh, part of the uh, the first question, which, uh, as a follow up to that about the uh, the the the, uh, the spins, and then initiating a period of accepting the Kung Yin force. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like uh, the the question doesn't quite work for you, but. Uh, but based on that, it then says, as is held by the tradition of the yellow flower or the golden elixir, this is uh, said to be compressed. And um, I, do you I have don't any know. thoughts on that? I, okay. I will say that one time when I was practicing meditation and I uh, blacked out, I, I went into some kind of stasis. Uh, at that time, uh, everything, I, I went through a phase where I was seeing different uh, like colors or, or special effects or whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, one seemed like fireworks and then I went to a place that, that was completely still and, and uh, sort of like a, a dawn. Uh, at, that, at that point I could hear a whirring sound and because I was sitting on the uh, seashore I was thinking to myself, oh cool, there's a boat passing. but. Uh, it just kept going on and on and on and on, getting louder and louder. Uh, when I asked my teacher of Tibetan Buddhism about that, he said that was the sound of the chakra spinning. I don't know if that was the case or not. I, I'm really not familiar with with spins or, or orientations or anything like that. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, because this, this is free spirit again. Hello? Um, in understanding that meditation can be different for each individual, are there any tips or pointers that you can give on how to get started in a productive manner for those who want to learn how to meditate? And what would you say is the goal or should be the goal of meditation? That's a very good and important question. Um, Life is very disturbing to trying to meditate. So uh, one way to begin to meditate is to either let things go, if you can, uh, or become victorious, whichever suits you better. Um, meditation involves Surrendering, surrendering yourself to simple existence, to letting your conscious self just exist without uh, your ambitions, desires, hopes, fears, opinions, etc., etc. So I would say to be able to successfully meditate, you would have to deal with those in some manner. Uh, now, either that means accepting where you are now, it means not having any, uh, or it means being able to accommodate all the above so that you can spend the time to get to the state where you can actually uh, know your primal self. And why is that important? Uh, over and above any metaphysical benefits it may have, and, and there you know, I mean, uh, that's a big question mark for all of us. I mean, uh, when it comes down to it, there are so many different dogmas and religions and opinions and everything else on the world that I personally would be hard-pressed to say that this is right or this is wrong. What I can say is that if you experience meditation, you will become a more complete human being, and it will allow you access to inroads that you... Uh, may never have had. Now, whether or not there is a metaphysical benefit to this, uh, I guess I'll find out when I die. Uh, I don't know how I'll be able to let you know at that time, but I'll keep it in mind. And along the same lines, it's understood that if one is thinking or is conscious of self, that they're not really in meditation. It's kind of what you were talking about. That's correct. But this is kind of confusing to me because I know often, like for me, I'll still receive images or messages um, when I'm out there, so to speak, for lack of a better term. 
and that I then become conscious of these. So when one is learning, um, and another example would be when you're learning to move chi into the dandian, you know, are you not making a comp conscious effort to do this? So mm -hmm. how does one differentiate between these types of mind-oriented awarenesses and the non-preferred types of thinking or consciousness of self? Well, do you ride a bicycle, madam? Do, do you know how to ride a bicycle? Yes, sir. Are you are you conscious of the bicycle when you're riding it? Yes, sir. You are? Okay. Uh, most people are when they're children and they're starting to learn, but then when they're riding the bicycle, they're not consciously pedaling. They're, they're just doing it, and their mind might be somewhere else. So the... The breathing aspect of meditation, which is important, uh, can become like pedaling a bicycle. Uh, you don't really think about it. It's just something that you do, and then your mind uh, is free of that. The What you mentioned about getting inputs and coming back and forth, uh, I believe that's like coming in and out of a room. That is to say that when you're in meditation, you're made aware of something, and you exit meditation briefly to become aware of it, and then you go back in. Um, again, that having been said, I mean, uh, I've used this feeling in sword fights, so you're definitely aware of everything around you, but uh, when you're, when you're in, in the fight, but... Uh, when you're practicing the meditation, you should try to not be. The good way, uh, a good way of checking if you're there or not is to uh, not be aware of time. I mean, if you think that the five minutes have gone by and an hour has gone by, then chances are you're in meditation. If you think that an hour has gone by and five minutes have gone by, chances are you are not. Yeah, I like that about the checking in and out. I kind of can relate to that. Um, and something else that happened to me recently, um, and I was in very deep meditation. I don't even remember anything about it until I did it, <clears throat> until I came out. And what happened was all of a sudden I saw myself sliding down this chute, almost like a water slide. And at the bottom of the chute was this vast ocean. I mean, it was just, it was like, I don't know. It was just everywhere. It was as far as you could see. And it, it scared me. I, I thought, well, if I go into this ocean, I don't know my way back. And it gave me a knee-jerk reaction back to the here and now and out of meditation, like instantaneously. And could this have been the ocean of consciousness? And have you ever experienced something similar to this? I've experienced almost the same thing. I was outside of my body. Uh, looking down on myself meditating and uh, and then I became afraid and then of course I was back in my body and when I uh, told my teacher about it he said why the hell didn't you go look <laughs> so you know uh, I, I can't answer those questions uh, I don't know what would happen if somebody went and looked uh, I'm aware of this mass stream of consciousness uh, all the time. Um, how deeply I go into it on a daily basis, I don't. I mean, uh, it's there. When I have to use it, I do. Um, is it a good thing to go into it? I don't know. I, I firmly believe in it. Uh, it's not just the my own experiences or the uh, historical and, and cultural record uh, all around the world that refers to that thing. It, it makes a lot of sense from uh, every perspective that there is a mass conscious, mass subconscious, and uh, that somehow it guides us. Now, um, you want to call it the great soul and we return to it. I mean, how can we know what, what it is? You, uh, For me, it's like ants trying to understand human beings. I mean, uh, I've watched ants watch me whenever they're aware of me and for me trying to understand what happens in, in, in that context is pretty much the same thing I mean I'm it's beyond me so at this stage in my life I'm saying well you're an idiot for trying to to uh, 
describe it or categorize it or whatever, uh, one day you will go into it. Uh, so. So don't rush it, right? <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. Um, but a little bit of follow up on that. When you say that, you, you know, when you need it, you you access it. Can you clarify that a little bit? When I need to use uh, what's termed the, the mass subconscious, it's it's there for me to use if I have to use it. Can, can you just explain how you go about that? Uh, no, it's it's not a, it's not a physical process. Like I said, it's it's always there with me. So uh, it's something that I can just tap into. It's uh, you know I use it when I'm when I want to show something to a student in martial arts, uh, uh, or I even use it uh, when I work when I want uh, to achieve a specific goal. Sometimes, although that's kind of cheating. Um, it's just there. I can't really explain it any better than that. Uh, right. I guess I was just curious as to, like, do you ask the consciousness a question to help you, or do I, you just I, I, I ask it, yes. I, I ask it to help me. But it's also kind of like a command, too, you know? I mean, it's uh, please do this, and, and, and then uh, we do it normally. Okay, because that that's... Thank you for that, because I know often... I'll ask questions before I go into meditation, and often I'll get answers. So thank you for that very much. That's that's a good way to do it. I mean, uh, if there is a mass subconscious, and, and I believe there is, then uh, it's a hell of a lot more powerful and wise than we are. So, I mean, you meet a, a powerful person in everyday life, you know, a billionaire or a politician or, or a... Uh, psychotic dictator or whatever it might be and uh, you normally polite because you know they, they're powerful so it's good to approach the mass subconscious in the same light uh, since it is powerful it's nice to be polite to it but it's also uh, it's also a part of us so why wouldn't you be polite and respectful to yourself excellent point thank you so much My pleasure hi Costas this is Green Meadow again You'd mentioned the enderic system. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's yep. in addition to our nervous system. Can you tell me a little more about that? Uh, well, you can look it up on, on uh, Wikipedia so that I don't have to. It's, uh, it's a nervous system that exists within our guts. It's a remnant of uh, the time when evolutionary we were shellfish. And it is not connected to our uh, the rest of our nervous system for the first six months of our life and becomes connected after that through the vagus nerve. Which I found very interesting because the vagus nerve is also called the pneumogastric. Did I answer that question? I mean, if you're, so if you're that's, looking... So that's like the gut intuition. That's correct. And it's very interesting because in, in ancient Greek myth, the, the first goddess of wisdom was a woman. And she was married to the god of thunder, uh, who was the powerful dude of the time. And then uh, one of the titans came along and prophesied that she would have a child who would dethrone the god of thunder. So the god of thunder ate her and put her uh, in his belly. So since then, Mitis, which is the name of that, of that goddess, the goddess of wisdom, dwells in uh, your belly and gives you intuitive wisdom. So if you want, then this is more of a yin wisdom, something that's more connected to the mass subconscious. So so the feeling in your gut that you get is because uh, this goddess, this mitis is telling you, hey, you know, be careful, or it's some kind of sense that manifests through the enteric nervous system uh, that we're really not aware of how it happens. Is it it can't just be a processing of external stimuli because the enteric system is only connected to the rest of the body through uh, one nerve, the vagus nerve. And to assume that the vagus nerve is pumping all the uh, feedback information we get from our senses uh, to the enteric system uh, so that it can process for this intuitive wisdom, it's kind of counterproductive, I would say. I would think that evolution would come up with a more efficient method. So the enteric nervous system 
kind of is an interesting circumstantial evidence for a lot of things regarding the yin field and, and this type of training and that, by virtue of our own anatomy. So just look it up on Wikipedia and, and you can see the uh, yeah. who discovered it. And I think it was originally discovered in 1929 and they forgot about it and then uh, somebody published uh, the results of their, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm terrible with names, of their uh, research uh, circa 1999 or 2000. Thank you. That answers my question. Sure, Costas. Um, I'm wondering if you've uh, studied or spent any time looking into things like the Monroe Institute's training or perhaps um, lucid dreaming or remote viewing, anything along those lines. Lucid dreaming I've done in the context of uh, my own training, uh, but the other things, no, I, I don't know uh, what the Monroe Institute does. If by remote viewing you're you're talking about uh, things, uh, for the, example, the military, on, the military <laughs> style of of developing uh, ideograms so your conscious can contact your subconscious. Right. No, I, I've never done anything like that. Uh, normally, when something uh, affects you and you're meant to know about it, you just know without understanding how that happens. So uh, I've never trained being able to find terrorists or anything like that. Yes. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Lucid, lucid dreaming is, is very much a, an aspect of meditation and of making both. Next question is from Uranus. Hello, Costas. Um, these coming questions are, are going to be related to current events, karma, and the future. And my first question is, um, Given that most of the information we have access to is through the mainstream media, could you give us some first-hand observations of what is happening in Greece and what the experiences and perspectives of the Greek people are? Um, and could you, making positive use of upcoming challenges actually be an opportunity? Well, uh, what's happening in Greece is that a method and system of government that's been in place uh, basically for the last 30 years is finally peaked and is no longer able to pay its bills. Now, they've promised a lot of things to a lot of people and they're no longer in a position to uh, make those promises true, so uh, a lot of people are very angry and they are reacting violently. Uh, I believe there will be more violence. And is it an opportunity? Well, when I made the decision to uh, move back to Greece, uh, circa 1992, there was a, an agricultural base uh, in the country. Uh, I was very surprised because, you know, you'd go to a fruit market and you could smell the fruit from about, I don't know, 500 yards away. It was fresh. It was... Uh, there were local animal stocks, there was local industry, small industry, but, but present. And what happened is when the country fully embraced EU subsidies, then these local industries were removed. As a result, now Greece has almost no agricultural base and almost no uh, production capacity. They have, the economy is uh, strictly reliant on tourism and on uh, the uh, the oil tanker uh, lobbies, because Greeks are uh, the largest uh, merchant uh, fleet in the world, as far as that's concerned. So, the rest of the of the uh, the vacuum that was left in the real economy uh, when that happened was taken over by the government sector. So the government moved into everything, and virtually, I would say about seventy to eighty percent of the economy here in Greece is centered around the government in some fashion or the other. So uh, if that goes away, and that is going away, what are people going to eat? Now, does this represent an opportunity? For me, I believe it does, because it's not that far back that uh, people had their own fields and they were working them, or they had their own small industries and they were working them. And the reason for that is that Greece has been under occupation for an awfully long time. Uh, we were conquered by the Romans in 146 
BC. And since then, and until uh, liberation, circa 1825, uh, the, the, the populace had learned to survive as, as uh, citizens of somebody else's country. So uh, the culture, the popular culture that, that was in effect when I was growing up was to be independent. That, you know, I mean, in my village, uh, the uh, people made their own clothes, they, they raised their own foodstocks, and uh, at the same time they went off somewhere else to work if, if they needed to. Um, I believe and I hope that that will make a comeback because it's only one generation removed and that the country will be in front in front of the curve because of the disaster that's happening now. Because I think that Greece is a microcosm for what's going to happen all over the world over the next 10 years. Well, by saying that, you've actually uh, answered one of my next questions, um, but I'll ask it anyway in context. Um, do you see the movement of bringing back the ancient Greek martial arts tradition and lineage as perhaps a vital spark towards the balance for the Greek people as a whole, given as a battle for sovereignty and justice has been placed in your financial and cultural lap? And finally, is there a connection between Greek, the Greek people, and world karma? Uh, well, you know, to answer your last question first, I think uh, all of us have uh, something to do with world karma. Uh, yes. Not only the Greeks, <laughs> but uh, the Norwegians and, uh, and the Chinese and the Australians and, you know, the, the uh, citizens of Lagos. Uh, we're all part of the world and the planet, so every one of us is just as important as everybody else. Um, do I think that uh, Greek martial arts coming back? First of all, I don't believe that, that uh, the martial arts of ancient Greece have, have made a comeback. Um, there are some federations out there that are basically uh, trying to call a, a very bad karate as, uh, as Greek martial arts, but if you look at the historic uh, depictions of the... Uh, of the ancient martial arts, they they really have nothing uh, to do one with the other. Mm. Uh, do I believe that it's a matter of national pride? Well, you know, you, you have to look at uh, martial arts have always been politically connected and, and, and politically uh, motivated. I mean, look at the creation of, of judo. Look at the creation of karate. Look at the creation. And when I say creation, I mean the formal declaration of same. I don't mean about the roots or how. Uh, look at uh, Taekwondo or, or, you know, um, all these arts were instituted uh, after World War II, basically, to, and not Judo, of course, Judo was uh, a long time before that, uh, to try to enhance the, the self-prestige and the, the internal empowerment of the populace, which had just suffered through terrible, terrible things. Um, but you have to be very careful about how you look at these things uh, from a modern-day context and, and what what they really were. I mean, uh, the Greeks had no word for, for martial arts other than martial arts. I mean, there was no, no system of it. In fact, uh, uh, you know, there were dramatists that, that used to mock uh, martial arts uh, in their plays and uh, generals that thought that uh, athletes did not make good soldiers. Uh, but what needs to, to come back from ancient Greece are thesmic values uh, in our mm. system and democracy that have been forgotten and uh, political consequence and, and political uh, acceptance of, of, of one's uh, actions, and that is something that was very much a part of democracy when it was created. I mean, the, you're familiar with the English word idiot, of course. Yes. Its, root, <laughs> its root comes from the Greek word idiotis, and idiotis is just a private person uh, who was not a demotis, in other words, he, he wouldn't involve himself in common affairs. A demotis was a citizen who uh, involved himself in common affairs, and hence 
we have democracy, which is the the, the rule of the demos of the of the people, if if you will. But when democracy was instituted, everybody would come out and and state their own opinion, or had the uh, the the, uh, the opportunity to do so. In fact, civic responsibility was very much a a part of of the culture. I mean, there was no professional army. You know, uh, mm. every, Greek, every Greek citizen had his spear and, and shield at home. And, you know, so it's, if you want to see what's closest to, to how uh, I envision ancient Greek democracy and or perhaps even the, the ideals of the, of the founding fathers of the United States, uh, look at Switzerland today where you have the, the system of cantons that's even further subdivided by the, the system of municipalities within each canton. And there is no standing army. You have a militia where every uh, Swiss is a citizen. And, you know, somehow they've managed to get three different nationalities to get along. Because you yes. have Cal, you have uh, the French. And, and so the system itself, the, the, the principles that, that, that make the system uh, were, are so powerful that the cultural differences can be waved aside. And I personally believe that's how, for example, the United States used to be, and, mm. and that's where where we need to return to. But uh, in order for that to happen, you have to see a lot less YouTube, uh, a lot less Facebook, uh, a lot. I mean, I I uh, read on the internet, of course, the other day that that Borders was closing, and I thought to myself, my God, when. Uh, when I was uh, a young man in the 80s in the U.S., I, I used to spend uh, hours and hours in borders, you know, just or in bookstores in general, just you know, going around trying to find things to read. And, and apparently, people aren't interested in reading anymore. Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, that's true. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate your answer very much. My pleasure. Costas, uh, Jodo is the will of universe, and my understanding is it cannot be changed. My understanding is karma can be changed. For people that have mastered the power, like Lim, could they theoretically subvert their karma or transfer it to others? Some researchers have speculated this is being done today and say that that is why um, the elite are using symbology in architecture and in movies to offload their karma, karmic debt to others. I am curious if you think karma can be transferred to others in this way. I think that the transfer of karma is at best a postponement. I mean, how do you transfer a debt? At the end of the day, it's going to come back to you. And, for example, that's what happened to the Greek economy and hopefully won't happen to the U.S. economy over the next few weeks. Uh, debts don't go away. You can postpone paying them, but at some point, you know, somebody's going to send the bookies to look for you. Um, yeah, so the, I guess the, the essence was, could you unwittingly give your karma, negative karma, to somebody else, possibly? Unwittingly? No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But again, that's just my opinion. I, I think karma is a result of our intentions and actions. So uh, one could argue that, you know, if I hit somebody with my car while... Uh, looking the other way wasn't my intention to hit him but then again the question arises why was I looking the other way so am I not equally responsible uh, for what I did uh, regardless of not whether I had intention to, to do so yep, thank you um, the next question is from Uranus again Costas um, you've written in your blog please stop hitting the snooze button that it is too late that the plan did not work. I assume that the plan was to awaken people to the limits of growth, to counterbalance this insatiable growth pattern pumped out by the powers that be in their greed, which you wrote about in the last chapter of your book, which I found the best chapter of your book, by the way. Thank you. I'm good. <laughs> I'm curious about how you see our karma working out in a specific aspect. If many people are so mind-manipulated or socially engineered by the power that be that they unfortunately cannot wake up, does this differ karmically from those that are capable of waking up but take no actions in response to their karmic obligations? I, I, 
I have uh, a terrible problem answering questions on, on karma because, quite frankly, folks, I don't know. I mean, I'm not... Uh, uh, and and please uh, let me make it clear that I don't know. I don't pretend to have any of the answers regarding uh, dogma or any of the, let's say, more inherent truths uh, within the universe. But if I were the ruling elite, and, and of course they exist, um, I would be more worried about what's happening to my own children. I mean, when uh, George Orwell wrote his works, uh, I think it was right after the uh, Second World War, where he was already starting to see some of this manifestation when the sociologist C. Wright Mills uh, wrote this in the 50s, where he most definitely saw it uh, transpiring. At that time, there was still an elite in the sense that uh, the financial elite felt that they also must be intellectual and cultural elite either by osmosis or by learning or one way. Well, that's gone out the, out the door. I mean, you can tell just by looking at the, at the skions of the financial elite today. And I don't think there's a need to uh, name names, but look at who's ruling the, uh, you know, who's in the government or was in the government uh, in different countries around the world and who are we... Uh, who is in line to handle the board of directors for companies and how are, were their academic scores and what is their cultural record? I mean, uh, if you look at, I mean, Washington in the States used to go to bed reading Voltaire's letters. Mm -hmm. uh, Eisenhower used to read cowboy stories. Great. <laughs> Westerns, you know, more part, maybe they were even, uh, I, I wonder if George Bush could actually read Junior. <laughs> so, and and I mean, uh, look at look at look at who were considered. I mean, Paris Hilton. Come on. I mean, this is the the uh, uh, skion of the Hilton fortune. Give me a break. So, if mm -hmm. I was uh, a, a member of the of the power elite, which I'm not, um, I would be more worried about what is happening vis-a-vis -vis this situation to my own children or my own. Uh, progeny and, and uh, descendants than to what is happening uh, overall because if the plan was to have a uh, very powerful financial elite that's also an intellectual elite that's also a cultural elite well that's failed and you know that's been tried many times throughout human history uh, one of my favorite examples and, and, and hopes and fears of uh, what I hope will not happen uh, in the next uh, coming decades is what happened in Greece right after the Trojan War. Okay, if you look at circa 1200 BC, you have the rise of the Sea Peoples. Okay, and they destroyed everything. They destroyed Greece, they destroyed the Hittites, they destroyed the Canaanites, they reached all the way down to Egypt, and then the Egyptians were the only ones who survived because uh, their theocracy was such an institution that they managed to repel these invaders at their border. That's an interesting concept because now we know who these sea peoples were. They were the Greeks, they were the Sicilians, they were the Sardinians, they were the Lycians, they were all the people who were living in these areas where there were great kings and, and a financial elite in the first place. So the little people rose up and tore everything down. And the reason that uh, it didn't happen in Egypt was because they were so obsessed with the religion at that time that there was no intercultural penetration of these little people who were rising up within the kingdom of Egypt itself. There was no uh, fifth column, if you will, or whatever. Uh, but, you know, I mean, look at Eastern Europe. Look at the former Iron Curtain countries, how quickly. Ask Ceausescu how he felt, how he feels now that he's dead about what was happening in Romania and how quickly everything fell apart. And, and that's what frightens me, is that uh, the, the ruling financial elite, having forgotten the basis for elite government, which is that there, there has to be an elite of some sort, uh, and not just a, a hereditary, pampered, you know, privileged uh, bunch of stupid kids, uh, people are going to go crazy when they mm -hmm. start when they can no longer eat, when uh, you know when push comes to shove, when 
look what's happening, what's happening with the Arab Spring movement. I mean, uh, it's spread throughout all of northern Africa and the Middle East, and uh, you have civil war in, in one country, and you're close to civil war in another too. And all this just came from uh, one, you know, poor uh, merchant who was tired of being pushed around. Right. So it's it's a very volatile situation, and uh, I think that you know I pray that they will stop hitting the snooze button because what happened uh, when the first Dark Ages hit, when the when the Sea People's Revolution hit in 1200, is you had 500 years of culture basically ceasing to exist and going underground. I don't want that. Yes. Well, neither do I. Um, I do have to say something to you, Costas, that I know you're not an expert. You don't have all the answers. Um, but we are asking for your perspective. And we're hoping that your perspective might inspire us to think a bit deeper and um, that we can come to our own conclusions through our own experience. So that's why I ask these things. I understand. Uh, My perspective is that the answers have been given throughout history uh, since forever. And yeah. we're the ones who are not listening to it. I mean, you know, uh, 2,000 years ago, you had uh, a man nailed to a cross for telling people to be nice to each other. You know, I mean, uh, there's there's a uh, parable in the Greek Orthodox Church that, that tells the difference between heaven and hell. And the this monk, through his prayers, is, is uh, allowed to, he's deemed worthy of having a glimpse of both. So he's brought first to hell, which is this huge hall, and there's a never-ending table, and the damned are seated at, at this table, they're seated at this table, and the table is full of food, and good things to drink, and wonderful, wonderful treats, and all this and that, and they can't eat it, because the damned are given this uh, spoon that is exactly one meter long, and it's not long enough to bring the food to their mouth, and that's the only way that they can grab this food is with this spoon. The same thing with the goblets full of drink. Uh, they try to, to drink, it just dribbles out. So this monk then is then taken to heaven. Uh, and, and sorry, then the damned are, of course, you know, emaciated and swollen bellies and blackened and red-eyed and all this and howling. Da, da, da. Then he's taken to uh, heaven where you know, it's the same endless table filled with food, the same great hall and all this, except the people there are happy and they're joking and laughing and, of course, they're well-fed and this and that. They're feeding each other. The spoons are just long enough for one to reach the other, and if one takes one glass and gives it to somebody else to drink, then the fluid, uh, the drink doesn't spill out. So you know, that's a very profound and, and simple lesson right there, Yes, and it's one of my favorite stories, so thank you for, for repeating it. Um, my next question is, in that last chapter, you refer to the Chinese esoteric tradition of avoiding intervention in the course of affairs of the world at large, but stated that at times this tradition has been broken and that many masters have merged their karma with the worlds where they saw fit that out of love and concern for humanity they actually step in. It is like they are motivated to intervene to restore the balance of life. Well, I'm interested in this merging of the personal karma with that of the world karma. Could you delineate uh, the difference between personal and world karma or collective karma and how, perhaps how and when that line is crossed? Well, in essence, personal karma, our personal karma is a part of the mass karma, right? It's just a matter of how much it affects where we're all going. When you, uh, I used to design airplanes, so when you want to steer an airplane, you don't use large movements when you have all this momentum going in one direction to initiate the turn. You start by providing a little bit of what's called trim. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, trim will get the plane going in the direction, and then you can start engaging uh, further uh, aspects of the steering mechanism to to make the turn. But every little bit of trim helps. So, you know, uh, somebody that's an enlightened master uh, sacrificing his own 
personal ascension uh, on behalf of the world is what the Buddhist image of the uh, Bodhisattva is all about. It's right. what the main teaching of Christianity is all about. Um, you know, for me, it's just uh, looking at, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Stoic by, by uh, faith, let me put it that way. <laughs> so if, if I see another child, uh, I see my own child. If I see uh, an elderly person, uh, I see my own parents. If I see somebody from, who's suffering, I see myself. So if I do that, then how can I ignore them? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, thank you for that. I, I very much appreciate it. And um, I just have this feeling that uh, we're so infantilized, and, well, some of us are so infantilized now, we're going to be in for a rude awakening soon, and uh, I hope some people are listening to this. So thank you very much, Costas. You're welcome. Costas, this is Disaster Cat here. Um, my question is, would it be possible for you to describe more in detail how you envision the setting up of the new communities and lifestyles in order to get through the possible coming collapse period? Um, I've done actually uh, have a degree in history and have done a lot of studying of such periods. And what my family decided to do was um, to live in a small rural uh, community in Ireland on the outskirts of a village. Um, we're part of a community close enough to be larger towns for shopping by car but they'd be about a day's ride by horse cart. Um, we're also trying for middle ground between total self-reliance and taking the risk of being trapped in an, an urban area and dependent on public services containing no function. Is, is this the sort of approach you think is viable? And also, um, do you favor homesteads, individual retreats, planned small communities, or like we've done basically just moving into a rural village and becoming part of the landscape um, Well, being able to, fortunately, we, we were able to work at home and have small businesses. Um, one more thing, I have also noticed that rural Ireland, when we moved here, was very much like rural Greece when you moved there. And when the EU really came in, they tried to destroy the agricultural base, but they had not, thankfully had not not totally succeeded, so that's sort of where we're at. But any comments or information is most appreciated. Thank you. I think that uh, communities are far stronger than the individual. I mean, uh, I, I, I grew up reading science fiction, so of course, uh, you know, uh, unavoidably I, I watched Mad Max and, and uh, followed the whole post-apocalyptic uh, genre, but one thing that, that occurred to me out of it. And for the record, I don't believe there's going to be an apocalypse or a disaster or anything like that. I mean, uh, I think that uh, our greatest danger stems from ourselves, and, and that has to do with, I mean, look at, uh, at what happened to uh, Russia, uh, the, the former Soviet empire, and, and how they've rebounded in a, in a very short amount of time. I think we're in for a spat. I don't think it's the end. Uh, that having been said, I believe that when we come out of that spat, we're going to understand that the system of dependencies that we're in, we have instituted now is too complex. You cannot keep the matrix balanced. Uh, in fact, since professionally I'm, I'm involved with the, with the matrix, and, and I'll leave it at that, uh, there are so many aspects that are just not included in it that are astonishing. You know, it's just uh, it's just astonishing. For example, we uh, we rely so much on globalization and on the international transportation of goods, and yet we don't take into account and enter into those uh, equations the uh, burden on the environment that the bunker fuel spent by, by shipping during the uh, course of that movement, uh, it's not entered into in, as an expense in the uh, cost of the goods. So, you know, uh, from a financial standpoint, uh, it's a lie because you're not actually getting something cheaper. You're passing that debt on or that your karma, if you that karma, if you will, to a, uh, a future generation because the, the carbon output, which is, is probably, I think it's third or fourth uh, in the world, the, the, the total shipping fleet, if you look at countries, and don't hold me to this because I'm just quoting off the top of my head, if you look at the, the countries that are the great, 
greatest carbon emitters, you'll see that there's one culprit who isn't even on the charts, and that's the global shipping fleet, which emits as much carbon as the, one of the five top leading countries, and yet no one knows it's there. It's not factored into the equation, into the matrix of, of the cost of goods, but it must be. So uh, to get back to your question, because I'm rambling on again, uh, I don't, oh yes, that's right, I started out with the post-apocalyptic genre. I don't think that individuals can survive an apocalypse. I don't think that, uh, I've seen a lot of people who are saying, you know, I'm going to be a survivalist. I'm going to go up and, and start a homestead. And uh, Historically, and if you read history as, as you have, you'll see that that doesn't work. You need to be part of a community that will survive because you cannot predict, no matter how well prepared you are, every variable that you will encounter in the course of an event. I mean, it's just logistically impossible to say that I'm predicting everything. Uh, but... The more people you have in a nexus, the more people you have in a particular group, the more skill sets exist, the greater uh, capabilities you have within that group, and you have more and more people uh, capable of dealing with a particular situation. So I believe that, that society will, uh, of its own, because auto-organization is very much a part of our existence, organize into this state of affairs where you will have... Uh, small communities organizing where you have some local production. I mean, why import apples from across the world when you can grow them in your own backyard, for example? It's just, for me, it never made sense uh, because there has to be a cost-benefit analysis somewhere other than just simply the financial consideration. I mean, I know that I prefer my children to eat fresh goods because it's better for them. So how do you put a price on that? Uh, I believe that society will, that's the next next aspect, that, that we will grow where these small entities will, uh, of necessity, take shape. And then you'll just have a bunch of them. So you'll have, you know, a bunch of little villages where you have micro-diversification everywhere. And you still have the country of Ireland, but uh, in the context of uh, importing cotton from India, that's not so important because now I'm growing whatever it is I'm growing, linen or, or wool here or this and that, and I prefer to use that because it's less of a burden on the environment or X, Y, Z. And, and uh, I think people will naturally drift to that, but I don't think it's something that we can do individually. I think it's something that has to be done in the context of a, a group of people. Uh, personally, I'm very lucky because I'm from a small village anyway, so uh, in my context, you know, I think of uh, restoring the village to what it was when, when I first uh, encountered it when I was 12 years old. Um, and I think that people should look at such movements with this uh, viewpoint in mind that not just me having a homestead, but how can I convince 50 people to move into a certain area with specific skill sets and, you know, Generate uh, maybe if I'm a researcher from a university, I can bring another five with me and open up a lab there that would give work to further people. And uh, because you know you would need uh, to have a secretary or a school teacher or maybe a doctor present or uh, somebody to milk your cows or whatever. Uh, the thing is to start getting people actively involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of life as opposed to relying on other people to do them for you, because when you rely on other people to, to do things for you, then uh, you surrender self, you surrender a part of your own liberty and, and uh, sovereignty. There's uh, the Greek word for tradition is paradosi. Now, uh, tradition, people don't really understand it so much, but what it means is you trade things. So, if I have something today, then I might, I'll pass it on to the next generation, and when they have it, they own it. For example, uh, I grew up dancing to Greek folk music, and uh, before my time, uh, it was played on a reed instrument called the zurnas, and in my time, they played it on clarinets because they sound better, and there's really no reason to uh, maintain the zurnas, and yet the songs were passed on, the tradition was maintained. Uh, but 
that's only one aspect of it. The Greek word paradosi also means surrender. So in transferring your tradition, you're also surrendering it. And if you lose your tradition and accept someone else's, you're surrendering your own way of life to somebody else in adopting that. And what we have done is we've surrendered core values uh, of our way of life, uh, which was the independence that made the middle class strong all over the West in exchange for comfort. It's very sneaky. You know, I mean, I've worked in fields. It's no pleasure. Uh, and, and certainly seeking the easiest way to do it is a very, very strong carrot to swallow. But you have to be careful of the stick. And if that stick is that somebody can cut off my food supply at will, then that's an issue. Thank you very much. That was an amazing answer. I'm really happy. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Costas. We have one more question. Do you have time for no, one more question fine. before we close? I'll, I'll take one more question. Thank you. Plain? Well, like, like so many others here, they're kind of involved questions. I was going to ask if there are any authors or books you recommend uh, <laughs> other, other than Plato. <laughs> Uh, C. Wright Mills is, uh, was an incredible sociologist uh, who was killed in a motorcycle accident in the U.S. in the 50s. I would recommend uh, his work. Uh, I think that is remarkable. And, you know, uh, just uh, pretty much what's out there in the classical bibliography. I mean, I'm not uh, a particular scholar or or erudite the person who said, you know, you have to read this book or that book. I mean, uh, mm. there's a lot of good stuff out there. Okay, and then one real last question, which would be in your free ebook, you refer to DNA and the Greek word for evolution being from the helix. Yes. And so, do you have any thoughts on the idea that what passes for current civilization is actually a post disaster civilization? And uh, a related question would be, do you think that DNA is kind of a godlike molecule that explains different, uh, you know, psychic kind of phenomena? Boy, that's a complicated question. <laughs> let, let me start with the, the, the first one. Do I think that there was a civilization previous to known historic civilization? I believe that's what you're asking me. Yes. There seems to be uh, circumstantial evidence for that with the Atlantis myth and the, again, very circumstantial evidence that, that is found uh, around the world uh, that seems to indicate that there was a pyramid, a global pyramid building culture, whatever that might mean. Um, but from my standpoint as a Greek, uh, I have another question. Or, or a similar question, uh, because, you know, if, if you read the Atlantis mythos, which, again, was written by Greeks, so of course it's Hellenocentric, and, you know, uh, supposedly the Greeks were instrumental in, in uh, destroying Atlantean civilization because it had become corrupt. Now, one thing that you notice about uh, ancient classical, ancient Greek civilization, that always got me, uh, always raised questions for me, is, is the following. Why didn't they form large unified areas? Call it a country. I mean, okay, we're not very pleasant uh, uh, as a culture and as people, uh, us Greeks. I mean, we, we like to argue and fight with each other all the time. Um, there's, a, there's a joke of God inspecting hell and, and uh, going to uh, German hell. And, and hell, of course, is this large lake with, that's full of excrement and all the, the sinners are underneath. And, of course, German hell is run very efficiently and Italian hell is, is uh, run a little less so, but is still operational. And, and the Greek hell, when he goes in, he sees the demon off in the corner with a Walkman on reading a magazine. So he runs over and accosts him and says, where have all the sinners gone? And uh, the demon says, oh, don't worry, they're all in the pool. So the Almighty asks the question, he says, how is it? Are the Greeks so disciplined? And uh, he says, no, he's the, they're the worst race on the planet. But when everyone tries to escape, all the others grab him by the legs and pull him back down. 
So uh, we are still very much like that. It, it was the propensity for chaos in uh, ancient Greece and the strife between uh, the families and societies that actually created was the impetus for the birth of philosophy and these lands and the, uh, the very noble uh, achievements that, that the, the classical Greeks uh, made. Um, but irregardless of that, I always had one question. Why didn't they form countries? I mean, why wasn't there a large Peloponnese, you know, under some kind of civic authority? Wasn't, why was Alexander the Great's great, the first that united Greece by the sword and not willingly, you know. And then I have to ask a question. Was it because they remembered something from way back when? Was it that maybe this globalized culture that held sway whenever it did left such a dark shadow that its memory caused these people who for some reason remembered it not to want to associate, not to want to surrender power beyond the neighborhood. Because if you look at, at how close some of these city-states were and still are, you know, your first uh, response, instinctive response is, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I mean, why can't people who live 30 miles away form one country, but instead, you know, start fighting with each other? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense logistically, because war always... Uh, costs more, and yet they did. They had individual city-states, and they were very unwilling to surrender authority. Was it because, and again, this is pure speculation on my part, they remembered something that left such a bad taste in their mouths that uh, they didn't want to go through it again? I don't know. Maybe that was their DNA. Maybe it's something of DNA. Personally, I... Uh, having been involved with the uh, computer industry over the last 10 years, uh, I believe that DNA is capable of programming, of retaining memory, and the fact that perhaps our mass subconscious is programmed into the DNA on a physical level that, that we can't understand uh, at this point in time. And, uh, you know, when you, when you look at, at what a program is, it needs a physical medium to store it, or it needs some kind of standing wave. It also needs, if you look at what a computer is, you know, you have electrical energy coming in, powering it, you have a medium for storing the files and the operating system, uh, and then you have a, an interface where, where we're looking at it, but you always need a, a physical medium on which the software is going to operate. So maybe our DNA is like that. Maybe. Uh, there's something in there that, that they were aware of. I mean, I, I found the, because Greek is a very mathematical language, or, or was ancient Greek, most certainly is, uh, why would they call it from the helix and not something else? I mean, it, it's, it's just, for me, it's astounding. Well, I was impressed too. Yeah. I, I don't have an answer, but, but those, those are my opinions on on the questions that you you raised. Well, thanks very much for your uh, thoughtful responses. My pleasure. We have just spoken with Kostas Stanos at blog.pamachon.gr, P-A-M-M-A-C-H-O-N. Thank you for your time tonight, Kostas. The Greek philosopher Herodotus said, the only good is knowledge and the only evil is ignorance. You have tried for many years to bring the ancient knowledge of Nikung to the West, not only for personal gain, but predominantly to help change the path of humanity. Herodotus also said, Circumstances rule men. Men do not rule circumstances. And though you may not have changed humanity, you believe, you have changed a few people, and for that, kudos to you, sir. On behalf of Fox and all the members of the WebBot Forum, thank you. In our tradition, may you and your family have many pies to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your giving me a chance to uh, voice some of my opinions. And thank you very much, everyone, for your questions, and uh, I'm touched. Thank you, Costa, especially for your clear and steady thinking. I've been very appreciative of it. Be well.
Thank you, Costa. Yeah, we really appreciate the time you've spent with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Costa. I'll think of you when we eat the apples from our orchard and I'm spinning our wool. Thank you. Thank you. You helped me understand what's going on in Greece. <laughs> I don't understand what's going on in Greece, so I don't know. <laughs> Thank care, you very folks. much. Be well, folks. Bye-bye. Bye.